Hey everyone, Donovan Brown here. We're going to learn how the Azure DevOps team actually uses Azure DevOps to build Azure DevOps. But better than that, we're also going to show you how you can pick and choose the parts of the services that you need to use in your DevOps pipeline. Hey everyone, Donovan Brown here with another episode of Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm here with my friend Gopi, and we're actually going to show you how the Azure DevOps team uses Azure DevOps. Yes. Azure DevOps uses Azure DevOps for every item. Exactly. You know, it can be planning, it can be pipelines, all of those. Right. So just to give you an introduction on Azure DevOps, Azure DevOps suite contains uh, boards. Boards is primarily for planning and work item tracking. Pipelines, pipelines is the one that will help you to do continuous integration and continuous delivery. Azure Repos is for all code, storing the code in Git Repo or TFVC. Mm -hmm. Azure Test Plans is for testing, manual testing. Azure Artifacts is all about how do I store all my artifacts, new Git feeds into the Artifacts product. Right, and it's always funny, it's like an inception thing, but we actually use the product that we build to build the product that we use. So, so you know, we are close to, you know, 600 engineers who are right. continuously working on it. Given that the product actually uses the same product, we make our product much better. Agreed, dog fooding, or yes. as in, in, I think in France they say drinking your own champagne, but yes. it's a very similar thing. Right. Cool. So let's show me how the Azure DevOps team actually uses it. So let's like do a quick day in the life. Right. All right. I'm now just switching to the product. Like this is Azure DevOps, um, you know, product that we have, the entry point. You can see, you know, this is the repos where right. we actually just show, store the code. This is the pipelines, where we have build and release. This is the test plans. This is the artifacts, the same part that I just talked about. Right. Now, how do we use our own product, right? I'm just starting with primarily the CI, CD. I'm just assuming people know how we do the boards, okay. and how we do the code, but I'm starting with the builds. Okay. So from builds perspective, I just switch to the build hub. We have a definition called vso.pr. This definition gets triggered for every pull request any developer commits to your master. Right, and we do like, for what I heard, it's like 600 a day on average, right? 600 a day on average. Actually, right. you can just see it, at, you know, these are the numbers that we just keep incrementing, right, right, on a continuous basis. All the builds, you know, will keep going. Gotcha. I'll just pick up one of those and then just show you, you know, what is the scale and, you know, how do we run it? Like, if I just click on the test, Literally for every build, every PR build, we run 85,000 tests. Right. And you know, anytime you keep seeing it, this number keeps you know growing up, growing up, growing What's up. What's amazing is not only does that number increase, but we did it in six minutes and seven, in 55 seconds. It's just unbelievable the amount of code coverage that we get, and that we do this 600 times a day to make sure that the quality is baked into the product into itself. Into the product, yeah. Yeah, and this also is what I show people when I want to teach them that this scales, right? Trust me, we can handle whatever workload you're going to throw at it, right? Because we do this 600 times a 600 day. 600 times, it's unbelievable. Yes, exactly, right? And then the way that we actually just manage is I just showed you one called VSOPR. But once the PR is passed, then we have you know CI builds that get sure. executed too. Like onto the master, now we go to the master and then generate another build. We exactly go through the same validation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, sometimes we start adding more tests into Correct. the CI. Whereas in PR, we do only unit test. When it goes to the CI, we will do some more additional tests. Right. And we take a good build from there and deploy to all our developer environments, test environments, and then do a lot more testing. Yeah, because even in the prod environments, we do a ring safe deployment throughout there to get our code out into right. production as well. I'm just switching it to our dashboards to mm -hmm. show you how we do, you know, manage our builds. Like this is a dashboard that is available. You can see this is the master mm -hmm. CI. Like every, P after the PR is done, every master CI build that comes out, these are various test environments that we have. Okay various test environments and on every test environment there is a different kind of testing that's happening and literally every build gets covered like you know you can just see that on 7th like you know we have covered from the master roughly 54 56 and it's just going on sure. right it's currently just going on all the builds get generated and then going on and and if i have to today fork from this branch and then create a release like you know we do continuous deployment how do we do continuous deployment if I just to see this is one particular column, everything is green. Right. So if I were to just, you know, 
I pick up this code commit mm -hmm. and then fork it into my release branch if I want to create a Got new it. build and then take it forward. Gotcha. But not just that. This this is a good dashboard for any developer, you know, manager or a director who is sitting on it and who just wants to see what's going on. I can just to see that there are multiple reds, but this particular one, you know, started sometime at this point. I click on that. It actually literally takes me to what has started failing. Gotcha. Right on a particular stuff. Not just there. Now, if I go to the pipeline, it's a self-hosted environment. If I click on it, how many clicks do you think it'll take for me to identify what commits actually caused this? Well, I know the answer is not very many because it's all tightly integrated, and that's the key. Even though the services are individual and you can uh, acquire them individually, they're better when you use them all together, right? Correct. Because you get this amazing traceability because boards wants to talk to repos, repos wants to talk to build, build wants to talk to release, and they all tightly integrate. So it's really neat to be able to pinpoint a failure down literally to the line of code that I wrote right. because it's all integrated right. together. I'll just show you from here, literally in a you know, few clicks, I'll get to know, you know what commits are actually causing me. Like okay. everything was passing 100%, 100%, 100% on this. We just, you know, suddenly we thought, you know, 0%. Yep. One click, okay, it takes me to this. The second click that I will do is I just click on the pipelines. Second click, third click, I click on commits. And then this is the Now code. it actually just tells me, you know, one of the code changes of these two actually made all the tests fail. Exactly. And, and if the test fail, then, you know, user can look at it, he can, you know, pull his code back and then, you know, get it back to the healthy state. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just commits. We also show if there are any work items that are associated with it. Say sure. Here is the feature that is actually causing Right. The bug it. I was working on, the task I was trying to fix, it all right. gets shown Full up Full traceability. Well. End to end traceability. Now, let me just show you. What I have shown you is the developer workflow with respect to how the PR is done, how the CI is done, and then the CI gets, you know, end to end tested. How does our production environments look like? Sure. Right. So what I'm now just clicking on, this is a production, you know, definition. Right. And I shouldn't have edit permissions. Yeah, you know, I don't have edit permissions. Typically, we show edit button, but. Yeah, know, I don't have production. any there. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, we just have view permissions only. Right. Right. I, you know, I'll just click on one of the versions. Like the way we have actually divided our deployments are in stages. We have something called, you know, ring zero, right. ring one, ring two. You can model this pretty easily. You can just see like you know every you know scale unit that we target are available here right right and then you know typically we just take care of starting from ring 0 if ring 0 passes ring 1 ring 2 ring 3 ring 4 so today currently there is a deployment that's actually just going on for the ring 4 right it, ring it's already gone through ring 3 it clearly it was right. successful Correct. and one thing i like to point out when i show this screen is that ring 0 is the ring where the actual Azure DevOps teams work. Correct. So we're the first ones to get any of those changes to make sure that they're good for us. Right. And if they're not good for us, we don't push them on any of our customers, right? right. We send out another fix, and then only if it passes ring zero, and I believe it's 48 hours, it Correct. sits there with us, yep. which means it goes to Hyderabad with you, it comes yep. back to Raleigh, it comes back to Redmond, it does that twice. Correct. And if it survives 48 hours with us, we then promote it to ring one, and then ring one, I believe, is our internal people, like our MVPs right. and RDs and things like that. And not mm -hmm. until ring two, if I'm not mistaken, does it actually reach a public paying customer. Right. Right. Exactly. exactly. That's how it works. Got it. But now, again, it's not just that. Now, you know, assume if I want to now see, hey, you know, the Singapore cluster, you know, deployment is pending. Okay. If we want to know what payload actually the Singapore cluster, you know, uh, customers are going to get, I can literally click on that exact stage. And then I know that, hey, you know, here are the 30 commits are actually getting deployed to them. Gotcha. Right? We will exactly get the same traceability that I just talked about. These and are the bugs. The these are the user stories. These are the features are the tasks that they are going to get a benefit at. Yeah, the I can look at it at every stage of the life cycle. Right. And like I said, it's beautiful when you use it all together. But right. what, we've, what you and I both know is that we cannot go into a customer and say, rip out everything that you have and replace it all with Azure DevOps. That's what we think they should do sometimes, exactly. but there's no way they're going to do that. They have investments in Jenkins, they have investments in Ansible, but I tell them, no matter how mature you are on your DevOps pipeline, there's something that hurts in that pipeline. And what I want you to do is find which of these services from Azure DevOps solves just that one problem. Let's go fix that with Azure DevOps because what's the cool thing is, and I think you're about to show us, is that Azure DevOps can integrate with everything else that you already have. Right. Right, you know, you can use our product suite to get the benefit, this tight integration. Yep. 
But the Azure pipelines can work with any of your existing tool. Gotcha. If you are using Jira for your issue tracking, we do integrate with it. Right. Now today I have shown you Azure repos integration where the code commits, but if you are using GitHub, we support you. If you are using GitLab, we support you. Bitbucket, the whole Bitbucket, nine Bitbucket, we yeah. support you. And then if you are using for CI system as Jenkins, we have actually support for it. Right. And we have an internal approval system for customers to approve and then take it forward. But you have a you know ITSM you know service management system that is available like ServiceNow. Yeah, very popular. Right, and we have a set of tasks that are available for you know our own deployment. But you want to use Ansible, we have support for it. Right. So the next demo, I'm just going to switch the demo to show you uh, how we actually you know take a simple application and use various different systems. Sure. Like Jira and GitHub and um, Jenkins, and Artifactory, and ServiceNow, and I'm deploying to a Linux, and I'm using a Java application, and I'm deploying to AWS. Right. So essentially, other than Azure pipelines in this, rest all are the third party products exactly. that the customers want. Perfect. And I will also show, show you, you know, do I get the same benefits if I use Azure pipelines? Do I get the same capabilities? Same traceability. Same traceability right. is what I'm just going to show you. Okay. So I have a definition that is set up. I'm just you know, going to show you at a high level what is this definition doing. As you can see, I'm actually consuming a build from Jenkins. Okay. Right? So as soon as the Jenkins build is available, it will trigger. Then I'm deploying to AWS, mm -hmm. QA environment, and I have an approval approval that is configured, then I'll deploy to production. Correct. Let me just do a code change and then you know sub, uh, submit the code change, then you know we'll come back and then see it. Okay, got it. So you know here is this is GitHub. This right. is you know I'm in GitHub. I'm doing a code change. Like you know, we have a set of institutions that are available. Assume you know today, you know, we have an institute in Redmond. I am now adding Cambridge. Okay. Okay. Now while adding it, as part of the pull request, I am now going to link to Jira. Right? I'm okay. using GitHub here. The next thing that I'm do doing is I'm just linking it to Jira, Jira you know, issues. And the format here is KOD is the project name in the Jira and then the you know 11 is the issue type. Okay. Right? You know, whatever are the issue types you can say. And uh, adding another in institute. Okay. Okay. And then I commit my changes. Now, as soon as I commit my changes, we'll actually just see Jenkins should trigger another build here. Yeah, on the left hand side, we should see. Yeah, you should see 36. There it is. There you go. Yeah. Got it. 36 gets triggered. Now, you know, you will know that the 36 will get done. As soon as the 36 will get done, it is pushing its, its the, the artifacts into the artifactory. Now, I'm just, just jumping back to our release. And if I just to see the view releases, you can see that there is a new release that got created. Right. So this is the result of your Jenkins job completing. Right. And then that triggered the fact that there is a release. And now all the different parts that have been produced can now come together and be deployed using pipelines. Yes. Got it. Exactly. So now, you know, before I, I deploy to the QA environment, it is, you know, it's waiting for approval. You know, I can just approve it. And there are many people, I think, you know, just one person approving is fine. And we do have policies that are set up too, saying that, hey, you know, all users has to approve, any one user has to approve. Gotcha. Or, you know, you can approve in a specific sequence as right. well. Right? right. Because if I reject it, there's no point in bothering my boss to get an approval because I've already rejected it. Right. Correct. Got it. Right. And while the, in the, the execution is going on, we literally get live logs that are sure. available. You know, now this is the QA, you know, because I approved it, you know, it started executing. If I click on the, the logs, it just tells me what's going on in it, right? right? So in my application, I'm actually just deploying to the backend first, but once the backend is done, I'll just deploy the front end. Got it. And so right now, it looks like you're deploying to AKS. So that's an AKS cluster, that's Kubernetes. Right. And we have all the tasks that you needed, obviously, to deploy there. Correct. And now you're deploying your web app. And what's interesting is you did those sequentially, but you actually could have the power sometimes to do those in parallel as well. Yes, Got exactly. It. I can actually just execute them in parallel as well. Got it. While this, you know, this is almost getting done. Now, uh, yep, the, the the QA environment in AWS is complete. The next one, as you have seen, the first one, you know, we did an approval using um, our own system. Sure. But what I have configured the production environment is instead of using our own approval system, how about using um, ServiceNow? Integrating right? with a third party Integrating system. with one of the third party systems, you know, for it to uh, uh, work. 
So, you know I have this environment, I think you know once the environment uh, you know gets picked up, it's waiting for one of the agents to be picked up. I think in the meanwhile let me just you know show you how exactly our um, you know the workflow is configured here, okay. right. I think you know you can just see that there is a service now change management that is actually configured. Now what it does is it will actually just talk to the service now until the service now change management approval comes into uh, our system we will not take the deployment. Forward. Right. So right now, in the, like you said, we got a build from, from Jenkins, but we did not go instantly into QA. It basically said, I have to get approval from a human being to say it's okay to deploy into QA, which you did and it deployed. Right. Now it's going to say the next approval has to come from ServiceNow. Yes. So ServiceNow, you go over there, you perform whatever process you need to perform in ServiceNow, right. and when that's true, we're going to be able to continue into production. Exactly. Yeah. So you can see ServiceNow is triggered. It actually just failed for the first time because we haven't, we haven't approved done it. Yet. Right. And you know, in the next four minutes, if I approve, actually this workflow will continue. Okay. So I'll just jump to ServiceNow. This is my ServiceNow portal. If I click, I should just see a new request waiting for me. This yeah, is the new the request. This is the one prod AWS. Okay. Right. I will now follow the service now and then you can configure any service now workflow based on your enterprise requirements. Okay. Right. So in this particular case, you know, first it has to be requested for approval. And once it is requested for approval, it has to be approved by some person inside the service now. And then the person should mark it as go ahead, implement this, right? Okay. Then, you know, our um, our task will get you know executed further. So I'm just being David Lou now, and then let me just mark it as approve. I have marked it as approve, update. So the next one is, I would say it is scheduled. I should just change it to schedule to implement. Okay. And and now we've completed everything we need to do in the service now side. Yes. Got it. The service now side is complete. Right now, if I just switch back. Whenever the evaluation happens, sorry, this tab. Whenever the evaluation happens in this tab, that's when uh, you know our workflow will continue. Okay, so why don't you show me while we're waiting this three minutes, like what do the tasks look like, and right. how do we add them to a pipeline? Right. Okay. Now I'm just going back to the pipeline. Like, let me just show you how does the pipeline will look like. You know, if I want to add more, how do I add it? Like, okay. the tasks are you know similar. I just clicked on one of the tasks, right? So here the first part is doing Helm mm -hmm. and you can see that we are downloading the artifact from Artifactory and then we are deploying to AWS using the Tomcat. Gotcha. Right? But if I just click on this, you can literally see all the tasks that are supported. Right. And a lot of these come right out of the box and, and those are actually developed in a GitHub repository. Correct. Because I've had two of my pull requests actually end up in the box, which is really awesome to realize that holy macro, like my code is actually now available in every instance of Azure DevOps, which is really cool. Yeah. So most of these tasks are available in open source. Right. In GitHub, you can just search for Azure Pipeline tasks, you'll be able to see it. We, you know, it's not just, you know, I think one of the key thing I want to just to say is you can literally, you know, build any application. And you can target any platform. Any language, any platform. Yeah, because anything that you, what I say, say also is anything that you can do from a command line, you can do. You can do. From yeah. Mac, Windows, or Linux, right? right? Anything you can do from a REST API, you can do from right. Mac, Windows, or Linux. So the, the sky is the limit. But what I like about the task is it takes the complexity of REST API calls and, and command line interfaces, and it kind of takes all that away from you right. and makes these tasks even easier. And if you don't see what you need here, what I love is the fact that we have a marketplace too. Right. Right. So can you bring up the marketplace yep. and show us what that I looks like? I think I just have the marketplace that's, uh, you know. Yeah, here. so here you can search for security, you can search for testing, you can search for anything. And what you do is you get this amazing, uh, rich list of, of extensions that you can use inside of our yeah. inside of Azure DevOps. And some of these are built by us, some of these are built by the vendors. For Absolutely. example, the AWS one is exactly. built by Amazon, yes. right? And then there is a Sentry extension that is available. There is a Slack extension that is available. The service now is the one that I was just showing you. Yeah. Like, you know, pretty much, you know, there are many extensions that are available. If you look at the Azure pipelines, this is where the maximum, we have 650 extensions that are available. That's awesome. Right, 650, you know. You can do pretty much, you know, any task that is needed using one of these extensions. Absolutely. Let's just, you know, go back and then see if our pipeline is completed. Yeah, have we been talking long enough? That's the question, right? Have we been long talking for three minutes? And if so, we're going to see some yep. cool stuff here. So you can just see that the first yep. gate actually, you know, failed because it is waiting for us to complete the service now. 
Now, once it is done, it will just go ahead and take the exact you know, same payload sure. and then take it forward. Awesome. Now, while this is going on, I'll just show you. Like, if you have seen when people were using the entire Azure DevOps product as is, we had a great integration story. Yes. Right? Will we have the same integration story? Now, I'm just going to click on the, the AWS environment. If I just click on the AWS environment, it actually just to tell me, you know, what version that I'm just using, mm -hmm. right? And now if I click on the commits, it should show me the commit that I have done. I just added another institute and then this is coming from the GitHub, GitHub Enterprise. It just gives me the exact same link. Not just this, if I go to the work items, this time these work items are coming from Jira. Yeah, and it's also, it showed me the, the, the Jenkins icon letting right. me know that that was actually a Jenkins artifact that I was actually deploying as well. So right. you're still getting that same traceability that the Azure DevOps teams gets by using all of Azure DevOps, even if you don't use all of Azure DevOps, which exactly. is amazing, yeah. Right. So, so, so one of the stuff is, you know, one question that customers ask me is, hey, I am today on Jira, I am today on Jenkins, I am today on GitHub. If I want to transform to, you know, DevOps, when I'm adopting Azure pipelines, do I need to just to change my tools? The answer is no. Exactly. You can just, you know, keep your tools, bring in Azure pipelines, it'll just help you integrate all of these, and then you know get the transformation. Right, it's, it, it's it's the orchestrator almost, right? It's right. it's the I, I, people always argue like why do when I define DevOps do I not use the word tools and I use the word product? Because it takes a product like this right. to stitch all the tools together yep. to actually give you a DevOps pipeline. And this is a perfect example of where we don't require you to rip and replace anything. Right, right. There is a point that you need to fix, and I tell everybody when you're on this DevOps transformation, fix what hurts most first. Yes. It wasn't Jenkins because Jenkins was working. It wasn't right. Ansible because Ansible was working. It was the fact that you couldn't stitch them together. That's what hurt most. Right. And then putting in pipelines literally glued all that stuff together. And what's so amazing, it gives you such great traceability, even though you were picking and choosing your tool set. Exactly, and you get the traceability, and then you can build the similar dashboard that I have just shown you that you know we use for Azure DevOps with you know, whatever test framework and whatever test infrastructure that you are you know, working on, it'll show you the dashboard, it'll show you the results with complete richness. Gopi, thank you so much for coming out and showing us this. We're learning everything that we need to know about the Azure DevOps team using Azure DevOps. And again, if you want to use it yourself, you do not have to use all of it. Pick and choose the parts that works best for you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.